Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the, the 12J Marketplace Investment Conference. I hope you all had a great holiday and that you are completely refreshed and invigorated. And I hope that you're staying safe and leading a fulfilling life of, of sobriety, self-isolation, lots of Zoom calls, and perhaps like me, a little bit of gym. Um, I trust that you have a freshly brewed pot of coffee for the next two hours, which promises to be an exceptional program. My name is Mike Clare. I'm an independent consultant who specializes in fund distribution. And I've been involved in the, in the 12J industry for five years now. And uh, I've seen massive growth. I've seen lots of regulation change. I have seen massive innovation, especially in the last two years. And I've also seen the industry go from talking about predicted returns, forecasted returns, to actual real returns. And we've seen many, many potential investee companies become the recipients of funds raised by the many, many 12J companies. And this means that, that new entrants into the industry and existing supporters actually now have tangible evidence and real results on which to base their selection criteria when selecting a 12J fund. In today's program, we've got five speakers. The order of events, we'll kick off with John T. Sachs, who will give us an update on 12J, and particularly what is 12J and why you would invest in a, a 12J fund. The order of events thereafter is uh, Pablo Fatidis will present on Ori Capital. That will be followed by Devin Govinder, who will present on Lion Pride, followed by Sorrel Fisser on the Impact Fund. Gaurav Nair will take us away at the latter end of the program, talking about the Infinity Anchor Fund. And then John T. Sachs will come back onto the screen and uh, present on, on Zimbali Capital. Each speaker will talk for 20 minutes. The pace will be fast and, and punchy. If you have any questions, please just put them in the chat box. I will deal with those at the end of, of each speaker, and we will be running a poll as well. First speaker up is Jonty Sachs. Jonty is an executive director and partner in, in the Geltech Group, which specializes in, in Section 12J fundraising, fund formation, and administration. Jonty is head of marketing and new business. And prior to joining the, the group, Jonty practiced at Africa's largest law firm, ENS Africa. Welcome, Jonty. Thank you for joining us. Mike, thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you all for for giving the time. I will give, a, as Mike used the, the term, punchy introduction to Section 12J, and I'll give you a quick overview of the Section 12J market, uh, particularly around the sunset clause. We recently had a meeting with Treasury, so I can give you some nice insight into what's going on in the market. So without um, delaying you any further, for those of you who don't know, uh, Section 12J is a section of the Income Tax Act, and it was introduced in 2009 to encourage South Africans to keep some money on shore, but effectively to provide equity funding to SMEs. The investor or the taxpayer is incentivized through a tax deduction on their investment. And the tax deduction in my view has been probably one of um, the biggest marketing angle, angles for section 12J funds. Not nearly enough focus has been on the performance of the underlying investments, but all section 12Js offer you a really attractive tax benefit it's 100% of your investment is deducted against your taxable income in the year in which you invest. That is why you heard a lot or you've seen a lot of marketing from Section 12J funds because you have until the end of February this year to um, make a Section 12J investment as an individual or if you're a corporate uh, by the end of your financial year. But to enjoy the tax benefit, you must be invested for a minimum period of five years. If for whatever reason you need to exit early, you'll pay back the entire tax benefit, but without penalties or interest. As a investor, you are limited annually how much you can deduct against your taxable income. The deduction is two and a half million rand for an individual or trust and five million rand for a corporate. In the past, you could invest an infinite amount of money and some investors were investing over hundred million rand per year, but Treasury introduced the cap uh, to limit what they thought was abuse of the incentive. The sunset clause, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a couple of minutes time. How does the tax deduction work? I'm gonna explain it very simply. If you look at the middle column, here you have an individual. This individual elects not to invest into section 12J. Their taxable income is really large, 5 million Rand. 
no Section 12J investment, therefore their taxable income remains the same, and they'll pay roughly 2.1 million Rand in tax. If you look at the far right column, the same individual invests 2 million Rand in the Section 12J fund. Now their taxable income is reduced to 3 million. What this means is they'll only be paying tax on 3 million as opposed to 5. Therefore, the, taxes, uh, uh, the tax due is around 1.2 million Rand, and they've made an effective saving of 900,000 Rand. How does this work? Well, if you're a PAYE payer, in other words, every single month you've been paying tax, if you make an investment into Section 12J, before the end of February, a couple of months later, you'll receive a refund from SARS because you've already paid the tax. If you're a provisional taxpayer, even better, you'll be able to pay less provisional tax at the end of February. And that's an immediate benefit and a significant one. The next element of Section 12J, and I won't be speaking for much longer, is around capital gains tax. Capital gains tax on exit is probably the most misunderstood element of Section 12J, and it's probably one of the reasons why many people don't invest into Section 12J, and I honestly think it's because they misunderstand it. So here I'm going to give you an example on the screen of an investor who doesn't invest in 12J. They invest in a normal business. 100 Rand, after five years, their investment is worth 150 Rand. Because their base cost is 100 Rand, their capital gain or their profit on the investment is 50 Rand. So now they have to pay capital gains tax. An individual in the highest tax bracket pays capital gains tax at an 18% amount. This is nine Rand in this example, 18% of 50 Rand. So if you minus nine Rand from the 150 Rand, you are left with 141 Rand. Not a bad situation to be in. But if we take the same investment and assuming it was in a section 12J investment, 100 Rand invested after five years is worth 150 Rand. But because you've deducted the investment upfront. In other words, you've written off the investment in year one, your base cost is reduced to zero. As a result, capital gains tax is paid on the full investment value. So you'll pay capital gains tax on 150 Rand. At 18% is 27 Rand. And this is where many investors stop doing the maths because now they've calculated that they have 123 Rand in the bank account versus 141 Rand. But this is not correct. What they need to then do is add the tax benefit because they receive that for investing into Section 12J. So the 123 Rand now grows to 168 Rand in comparison to the 141. But in addition, you could also add the time value of money. Um, the 45 Rand that you receive upfront, you can invest that, earn a decent return, and then add that to the 168. But let's assume you don't. You don't reinvest it. You, you, um, what then happens if, if you do a comparison uh, you, the IR in the ordinary investment is 7% versus in the Section 12J fund of 17%. So there's a significant benefit investing into Section 12J just from the tax benefit, and it amounts to 8.3% per year as a return. So by simply investing into a Section 12J fund, if you're in the highest tax bracket, from the tax benefit alone, you're earning 8.3%. This is very important because when you look at the returns in the market, you need to minus 8% just to understand exactly what the underlying investment is doing. I see that there are people raising hands for questions. If you do have a question, please insert in the chat uh, in the chat section. And at the end of this presentation, which is in a minute or two, um, I'll be able to answer them. Finally, I wanted to discuss performance fees in the market. Because what is happening is many investors and financial advisors are waking up a bit late to the fact that they've invested or they've encouraged the clients to invest into funds which charge significant fees at the end of the investment. And as a result, a lot of the investors' returns are being eroded. So let me try and explain this. If you have a look at the far left, an investor invests a million rand. This investor is in the highest tax bracket. So if you see the, um, the second, uh, call it uh, line, the uh, investor receives a refund of 450,000 rand. So if you minus the two, you'll see the third line, and that is your risk capital. Now you actually only have 550,000 Rand of capital that you could, um, you, you, you know, if you had to lose, that's, that's your investment value that you'd start to, uh, start to be eroded because of the refund. So what many Section 12 j funds do, and, I, and I'm completely against it, is they say, because your risk capital is 550, any amount that you receive above 550, thousand rand, we're going to take a performance fee of say 20%. So effectively what they're saying is we're going to take 20% of the tax benefit and of any amount above that. 
Now, from an investor's perspective, um, alarm bells should ring because what happens if they only return 700,000 Rand? So you've lost money, but now you've incentivized the uh, fund manager to earn a performance fee, even though they've lost money. Well, what happens when the investment does really well? Well, I'm going to show you on the next slide what the numbers look like. This is often called a risk capital performance fee or a net investment performance fee. Some fund managers have taken a lot of um, uh, complaints from investors, so they have now in introduced a hurdle. Um, and I'll show you what those numbers look like. The far right-hand column is how we think that uh, fund managers should charge performance fees. Simply, if you invest a million rand, if it grows to 100 uh, to 1.2 million rand, a performance fee should only be charged on the growth of investment, surely, because you're incentivizing a fund manager to, to grow your investment. So he has the mass. The first example is the example which, which we promote. You invest 100,000 rand, if it grows to 120,000 rand, a fund manager charges typically 20% on the growth of 20,000, which is 4,000 rand. The next column, risk capital performance fee, the, uh, the gross investment is 100,000 because uh, 45,000 was returned as a refund, the risk capital amount is 55,000 Rand. And this is when the maths gets interesting. So because the investment has grown to 120,000, the fund manager takes 20% of the difference, 20% of 65,000 Rand, which equates to 13,000 Rand. But remember, you've only made 20,000 Rand and the fund manager is taking 13,000 Rand. So effectively the fund manager is taking 65% of your profits. That is why these type of funds really aren't in a position to provide significant returns to the investors, because at the end, the fund manager is really taking all the profits. The last example is where there's a hurdle, and let's assume the hurdle is 7%. So if the fund doesn't achieve at least 7% per year, then the fund manager won't earn a fee. But on the same example that I've given in the other two examples, the fund manager takes 43% of the profits, which I still think is alarming. So what I think is very important is that you understand exactly how the performance fees are charged. Uh, the funds that are presented today charge the correct type of performance fee, gross capital performance fee, so you have nothing to worry about. Then lastly, when Section 12J was introduced, um, there was always an end date. The end date is the end of June this year. And what this simply means is, if Section 12J is not extended, you have this financial year, at the end of February, and then at the end of June this year to make a second investment for the, for the following financial year. You can enjoy the tax benefit. It doesn't, it's not taken away from you if it's not extended, but you have a, a limited window in which to invest. My personal view is I think uh, uh, Section 12J will be extended. We'll find out at the end of February um, or early March when the budget speech is um, presented by the finance minister. But our discussions with Treasury as recent as early as December seemed extremely positive. Treasury asked numerous questions and it appears, or in, in my view is, I think there will be an extension, but the areas in which we can not invest currently, which include uh, residential or commercial property, um, financial services, um, businesses that are in arms, uh, arms, ammunition, alcohol, gambling, and professional services, those are companies we can't invest in. I think that that list will be increased to include the fact that we, we won't be able to invest into hotels and student accommodation and lodges, which we currently are able to do. My personal view is I think they'll prevent us from doing that. Um, whether it's a right call or not, uh, my personal view is I don't think it's a right call. I think hotels employ enormous amount of people on day one, but Treasury wants to see more and more money into SMEs. Thank you very much. I hope um, that gave you a good insight into uh, Section 12J. Thank you, John T. And well articulated as always to the point and leaving the listeners with absolute clarity. I noted that you highlighted one of the critical issues in, in Section 12J, performance fees. And um, it's worth noting that informed advisors are definitely starting to avoid funds that are charging excessive performance fees. And I thought that you explained that very, very well. Thanks, Next Mike. speaker in the program is Pavlo Fatidis. Pavlo is co-founder of the Auric Capital Fund and CEO of Auric Business Accelerator. Many of you would have listened to Pavlo speaking on the Bruce Whitfield Business Show where, and, and Cape 702, I beg your pardon, Cape Talk and 702. And Pavlo shares his experience uh, on entrepreneurship and business strategy, always focusing on, on business growth for small and medium-sized businesses. 
Pablo, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, Mike. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Jaltech, thank you very much for organizing this event. I always look forward to it every year. And to all of, the, all of you who have joined us, um, I really appreciate you giving up some of the time. Um, I'm going to be going for around 15 minutes or so to introduce Ori Capital. I'm going to do so through a shared slide uh, set or pack or deck. And please do send any questions through the chat. If my time is up and don't have a chance to answer it, I will be sure to get back to you either directly or through Geltech. I'm going to share my screen with you so that we all reside and function on the same page. Fantastic. Good. Um, so Ori Capital is a Section 12 debt fund. It's specifically there to fund growth momentum in SMEs. We define SMEs as businesses doing annual revenues above 15 million a year, up to 300 million rands a year. The definitions vary wildly across multiple services offered through government, across banks, across other large institutions. For the purposes of Ori Capital, we define them as businesses upwards of 15 million a year to 300 million a year. These are businesses that are largely exit focused across the portfolio of in potential investees that we are able to service. The average age of the business owner is 49 years of age. The average tenure in their business sits at just over 17 years. And what makes this particular target market exciting from an investment point of view is these individuals have all their wealth and all their potential wealth tied up in the business. It's the nature of a business owner 17 years in to continuously invest in the business with the view to secure a capital exit. That capital exit is perceived by this audience to be the payback for all the risk and sacrifice made in building the business. That's the nature of the business owner. They're deeply committed. In many instances, around 42% of these businesses are family owned. They're moving towards an exit and that exit is quintessential to their wealth generation instance. A lot of you as financial wealth advisors know these individuals, you know the families, you've met with them and I've no doubt in all your conversations with them, they predominantly talk to their business as their greatest source of wealth creation and wealth generation. We have around 300 plus SMEs from which to select investees. That portfolio of businesses, and I'll talk to how we source our SMEs for investment purposes. That portfolio of businesses closed off their average compound annual growth rates almost a year ago, February last year, at 28.9%. This is a portfolio that we're actively managing, and it looks as if that exact same portfolio will be closing off their average compound annual growth rates at around 25%, despite the year of COVID that we have just been through and continue to reside in. What makes us special is we invest into growth and we have a very particular manner and means of measuring growth momentum. Growth itself is not simply a lift in turnover. Growth itself has to be demonstrated by the ability of the business to have created scale preceding the growth and therefore increasing the EBITDA numbers. We have a very active post-deal management system where we sit with all our investees on a monthly, if not three monthly, uh, three, uh, uh, three times a month, from three times a month up to once a month. And we use extensive data to track performance around risk and performance around growth itself. Our targets are to deploy our full capital in a six month period. And we are targeting an IRR of around 25% per annum. I'd like to dig into two elements that really set us apart. The first is how we get our deal flow. Arguably for any VC, one of the most expensive costs is that of deal flow. You make a call to provide capital, many apply, but the process of effective due diligence is extremely costly. From an ORI capital point of view, 
we've managed to avoid that entire cost. We work hand in hand with the Auric Business Accelerators based in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. They themselves are privately owned businesses that offer business growth services to the SMEs with annual revenues above 15 million and below 300 million. At this point in time, both Auric in Johannesburg, Auric in Cape Town have a collective portfolio of over 430 SMEs. The reason we think the addressable investee market sits at around 300 million is because a number of those SMEs are doing above 300 million a year and a few are doing slightly below 15 million a year. The process they go through with Auric Business Accelerator is extensive. It takes them into a situation where those businesses as they come on board are under, undergo extensive diagnostics in order to clean up books, to clean up strategy, to identify the people dynamics and to customize a growth path for the business owner contracted to do so by Auric with the view to take that business to a point of exit. After six months of being with Auric Business Accelerator, those businesses have an opportunity to apply for growth momentum funding. And then they are introduced into Auric Capital where they are evaluated by a completely and distinctively different Investcom whose focus really is around risk management and performance um, uh, management. A large part of the risk management element performed by the investment committee in Aura Capital is that of um, exit management. In other words, the business itself, given its nature, given its growth path, given the momentum it's coming in with, given the application of funding to support the customized growth path, what is the end game and how do we as Aura Capital harvest our investment in that business itself. I'll share with you just a few elements of how risk is managed. Every single business provides 29 points of data, 14 of which are financial um, data coming from the monthly accounts. The remaining elements of data look to lead generation to identify growth, lead conversion to identify efficiency, and lead fulfillment to understand scope, scale, and the ability to leverage a fixed cost base to drive revenues. Those points of data are consolidated into a series of algorithms which help us manage fundability, cash flow. We go down into extensive detail around trends. Those, those algorithms help us forecast the growth momentum and forecast the level of the business's capacity to continue servicing revenue growth. When we fund businesses, we fund them rather unusually. If a business makes an application for three or four million rands, after having vetted the business, ensured that it is for growth momentum as opposed to in order to grow, we then able to apply that funding through various tranches. The process of applying funding across a number of tranches over a period of time can be quite expensive for any VC to manage. The benefit we have is because the data we procure is real time, it's monthly, it's consistent, because we have the algorithms, we can forecast trend. It allows us to apply that funding through one, two, three, or four tranches in each instance where, for example, targets are met or milestones are met. And that immediately reduces the risk of this portfolio dramatically. I'll share a few stories of some of the investees. Um, he has a classical business. They are a steel and plastic drum manufacturing and reconditioning business. It's a nice, dull, boring business. Not many people want to play in this space because it is profoundly unsexy, but it is essential across almost every sector of our economy. Established in 98, a 30 million rand turnover, a family business, Three sons sit in the business, the youngest of which is 29, the oldest, the oldest of which is 10 years older. The father is sitting in uh, early 60s, so there's a really good succession and energy there. The funding they are looking for is to acquire an additional drum manufacturing business, which will increase its range and capacity of drum making, as well as ensure that it's able to make drums on site. What that means is this, when you travel, with drums to mines as customers or farmers as customers. You're transporting air, 
and you're bringing back an empty truck, it's exceedingly expensive. The technology they're acquiring will allow drums, both plastic and steel, to be made on site as in when and on demand. Another example, this business is founder led. It's a smallish business with around 60 million rands worth of turnover. It is run by an extensive, deep, profound Uber geek who understands spectrometry and always has. He's one of the seven leading authorities on a technology perspective around spectrometry globally. And the business that he has makes and supplies spectrometry equipment. Of late in the last five years, drones have become increasingly affordable and more widely used across industry. And the opportunity to now make smaller spectrometry payloads, in other words, the device that sits below the drone as it flies over crops or as it flies over buildings to identify the health of a crop, to identify the validity and the structural integrity of a building in order to indicate preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance of the underlying asset has increased dramatically. The equipment that he will be buying is in order to make the smaller payloads. Second to last example, a business established in 91, 20 million rands, uh, 21 million rands worth of turnover, founder led with a very clear view to exit. This business has secured some of the most fascinating technology. It's CAD AI ML technology. So computer aided design with artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. Effectively, if you look at the image over there of the grader, it looks at all the moving parts of the grader. It looks at the fuel systems, it looks at the oil systems, it looks at the pneumatic systems, and it identifies where the issues are in a piece of plant that is either not performing optimally or stalling. What's happened of late is over the last three years or so, large entities, corporates that it supplies the technology to have started to thin themselves out as a result of the no growth economy we find ourselves in. Instead of procuring the technology, procuring and hiring the employees to operate the technology, and then procuring the hardware to run the technology, they've started to place demands on this particular business to start providing it as an outsourced service. It's very exciting for the simple reason that prior to that, the sale of this technology was event-based or project-based. Now, with the service being provided, it creates an annuity revenue stream based on long-term contracts. And the last example is this business established in 1980 by a father, now run by the son. It's a next generation business with around 30 million rands worth of turnover. It is involved in the design and manufacturing of dyes. Dyes are, let's call them templates that cut leather, that bend steel, or that shape plastic. It's used extensively across the industrial economy in automotive, in manufacturing, in mining, in furniture, in clothing, you could literally name it. What's become particularly interesting is as a result of deepening crises in supply chains, there's been a massive increase in localization requirements that for these large entities right across the automotive space, for example, to start looking at local sourcing. The opportunity over here is to provide the funding to support the acquisition of new plant and equipment, which will drop the cost of dye manufacture by around 32%. And this business has secured extensive contracts recently in automotive and the food and beverage industry. I know my time is up. Uh, Mike and John T made it very clear that I need to finish at 10.30. It's highly unusual for me someone who's used to speaking and used to talking and loves doing so. Um, the call to action over here, how to invest. We have a partnership, a very strong relationship with Geltec. Please email Geltec at info at geltec.co.za. The minimum investment bites that we are looking at taking on board in order to manage things efficiently sit at 200,000 Rand. There's a full prospectus available and that would be made available as soon as you have engaged with Geltech. Mike, um, thank you very much for the time. If there are any questions you'd like me to address right now, um, and you're gracious enough to give me a few minutes, I can certainly do so.
Well done. Thank you, Pablo. Always very, very inspiring listening to you. And it definitely adds to the value and the currency of the 12J industry, having you involved as a, as a participant. Um, you highlighted the, the key differentiator for the Ori Capital Fund, which is that your business is working with companies, which puts them into a position which enables them to assess and then select them as a worthy recipient of, of growth funding. So I'm going to pose a question to you. Just articulate what type of advantage that gives you over other multi-themed 12J funds that, that perhaps don't have line of sight when selecting an investee company. That's a, it's a good question, Mike, because there, there are a number of advantages and very often these advantages aren't well articulated or spoken about. So typically an investor would be unaware of them. The nature of the SME market is profoundly different to that of the corporate market. If you look at South Africa historically, we've had extensive private equity funds made available. We've had funds housed in what is called VC made available. But in truth, our funding market is in its nascent phase. Those prior funds had always focused on very large businesses, if not corporate entities that were well resourced with extensive management teams, big history behind them and big balance sheets. The SME community that I refer to, the 15 to 300 million rand a year business, operates fundamentally differently. In fact, they have been one of the biggest, and I say this with a lot of caution, beneficiaries of the last year in our economy. They are thinly resourced, which means that any level of support is taken up and adopted very effectively and very actively. Secondly, because they're thinly resourced and thinly managed, they can make decisions very quickly to move with a shifting, varying, uncertain economy. And that places them in a position to capitalize on opportunities fast. The next thing is, given the environment we're in, given the history of our country, a lot of the SMEs manage their books fundamentally differently to the way one would in a listed entity. When those businesses come on board, prior to us investing in them, we have an opportunity to completely restructure general ledgers, put forward a set of clean books so that we can start to ensure the data we are getting is accurate data and reflects the performance of the business model rather than the frustration of the business owner. The second element is that when you invest in this community, Mike, you're investing in the nature of the business owner and the family. After six months of behavior and performance, we're able to get a clear sense around how that mindset operates. And in truth, given the economy that lies ahead, we invest in people before we invest in businesses because on a technical level, we have the ability to fix any business model and make it relevant to the economy, but it needs to be led by the right mindset. Pablo, we have a question from Jeremy Squire. Good morning, Jeremy. Nice to see you dialing in. With the diverse options discussed, how are new clients invested? I.e., do existing clients get exposure to new opportunities and new clients exposure to existing and new. I'm going to answer that question and perhaps ask Jonty to step in because the question in terms of Ori Capital um, is not as relevant as it is to other funds which have got track record. Remembering Ori Capital is in its second year of fundraise, so all monies raised will be invested into the opportunities. So it's not as though there is money that is previously deployed. Jonty, can you add to that and perhaps add to the relevance of this question for other funds? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think Ori Capital is in a very unique position where, you know, we've taken our foot off the pedal in terms of deployment, purely because of COVID. You know, the beautiful part about working with Auric Business Accelerator is we can see trends in businesses. So pre-lockdown, um, Pablo and his team can show us how business is performing in terms of turnover, et cetera, during lockdown, COVID. And then, and then as it subsides, we can see the trends in these businesses. And we've had quite a long period now where we can actually see how these companies are performing. And we now in the process of, of, or the final process of starting to make investments. What we're going to do is we're going to hold back on making the investments probably until um, after February. And then all investors capital will then be exposed to all of the investments that we make. So historic investors and new investors will get exposure to the same investments. And um, that's how it's going to be dealt with. It's very different in the other funds. So, um, you know, the fund that Gara will be presenting on infinity, there's a new share class issued every year. 
and uh, investors in those different share classes only have exposure to investments in that share class. All right, thank you, John Chen. Well answered. And Pablo, before you we go off and we we move on to our next speaker, Devin Govender, and um, perhaps give South African citizens a sense of how small and medium-sized businesses have coped through COVID and what behaviors and what level of spirit have you seen from South Africans? Um, so Mike, what happened last year, and I suppose this is a benefit of SMEs that sit within the Auric Business Accelerator uh, environment. What happened last year is uh, there was a view that the lockdown would run for three weeks. Um, naively, a lot of people believed it. Perhaps many of us believed it because we wanted to believe it to be so. The view that we took, given the fact that we have got clients in Hong Kong and had learned about the lockdown prior to, to arriving here, was that things were going to be particularly difficult. We immediately broke up a portfolio into three categories, a green for aggressive growth, an amber for moderate growth, and a red for risk growth. And we allocated our clients into three different buckets and we designed different strategies for each of those buckets to either survive, thrive, or step ahead. What we then saw is within every industry that we invest in across the 300 odd businesses, the mindset was one with around 10% of businesses saying, the status quo has changed. We need to make fundamental changes to our operating model we need to get ahead of this because customers and consumers will change their buying behavior. That occurred with about 10% of businesses. The other 90% of businesses hoped it would simply pass. By around August or so, we saw a thinning out of SMEs across sectors, anywhere from 10% up to 30% in the green and in the amber category. The red category where we don't have any investments or any activity at all, event management, hospitality, tourism, uh, retail, for example, the thinning out was far more aggressive. Across our portfolio, August, September is where we had turned the corner. The entire portfolio lifted on a far thinner cost base with massive increases in profitability. And that was the trend that we saw. Those that had support, that had perspective, that had an outside view, we managed to lift their heads from their trenches and model a different business to cope in this environment. If I may, Mike, I also saw a question come through in the chat around exits. The way we typically vision or experience exits within our portfolio, it's either through management buyouts in certain businesses. So for example, across the engineering services space, we have professional engineering capabilities, construction, you often see it. We have very few investments in construction. They're typically management buyouts that occur over there, but largely what we're anticipating is that the low growth environment in South Africa is going to see a lot of listed entities under pressure to acquire one of three elements. Innovation, we have extensive innovation right across the portfolio. Growth, with extensive growth rates sitting at around 25 to 30% on a compound annual growth uh, basis and through uh, uh, strategic opportunities to reach into new markets. So we envisage exits through corporate acquisition over the next five years, and I think it's going to increase quite actively. And in certain traditional instances, it'll be through management succession. To fund the succession, we have a relationship with three of the big four banks uh, that are familiar to us, familiar to our models, and we're able to provide debt funding to support the succession purchase of an exit. Thank you, Pablo. I think I speak on behalf of all the, the attendees today. Great to, to share your wisdom and to tap into that expertise. And thank you for spending the last 25 minutes with us. Thank, thank you very much for having me, Mike. Next speaker is Devin Govender from Lion Pride. Devin Govender is the CEO of Lion Pride Investment Holdings, vast experience in private equity and venture capital in, in California and South Africa. After 12 years in Santa Rosa, California, Devin returned to South Africa and joined Deloitte as an advisory partner and then co-founded the, the Lion Pride, which is the man code for the 12J Fund Agility. Devin, thank you for joining us. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, all. 
Um, let me just share my screen and just tell me whether you see it. Okay, do you see it, Mike? Yes, all clear. Thank you, Devin. Okay, so Lion Pride Investment Holdings manages a number of different funds. And um, I want to just give you a bit of a context of uh, the investment holdings and then take you into agility, which is the, the 12J fund. Um, so, so just talking on the agility uh, fund, we very, very technology focused. Uh, the fund was launched in 2019, January at, at the Jaltec event. Um, and we look at leveraging technology to improve the quality of the lives of South Africans. So we, we've, we very, very much focused on that bottom of the pyramid. So the, the management team at Alliant Pride, so this is the board. And, and I think when you're investing in companies, you know, knowing the people who are looking after these investments are, are very important. Um, so it's myself and, and, and Mike has given you a bit of my background. Uh, Rural Causa was a founding member of Lion Pride, although he's no longer on the board, um, you know, since taking uh, on the PIC role, he still is an investor in Lion Pride and, and founding member. Uh, Impo Makwana, um, he's been on the board of a number of companies, chairman of ArcelorMittal, um, and he's on the board of the Agility Fund as well, and so is Ivan Chaka Chaka. Um, who's on the board of both Lion Pride and the Agility Fund. Uh, Jeffrey Rothschild, uh, he is the chairman of the Agility Fund and uh, a founder of Lion Pride. And Stanley Subramanian, who's uh, on the board, uh, previously a deputy CEO at PwC, uh, he's the chairman of the Manco that manages uh, the, this fund. Uh, who manages our operations on, on a day-to-day -day basis from, from the Agility Fund. Um, uh, we've got two very, very experienced uh, practitioners, Brett Nido, who's come through, uh, you can see there, Coca-Cola, Tiger Brands, Kellogg, Ernst & Young. Uh, and uh, Dimitri, uh, out of Europe, uh, studied at the London School of Economics, uh, being with Accenture and uh, True North Partners now. Brett provides a lot of the commercial and analytical uh, risk uh, assessments, and Dimitri really acts as the mentor uh, for the people running these businesses. Um, just a little bit on our investment hypothesis. Um, uh, impact investing is the core. So as we said, you know, we're focusing on the bottom of the pyramids. We're looking at startups. So we very much in the frame of a classic venture capital fund, uh, you know, something that you'd probably find in, in the US or in Europe, uh, where we're looking at technology, we're looking at startups, and, and we specify here uh, using mature technology. So this is technology that's been tried and tested. Um, so this is not, uh, you know, blockchain or, or technology uh, like that, where we still trying to define the use case. And, and we use that to uplift uh, uh, the, the, the lower or the disadvantaged groups. Um, we think, we believe it's a mixed risk uh, because we look at pre and post revenue startups. Now, you know, whilst this may be considered uh, higher risk to some, um, I think, you know, if you look at uh, some of the big uh, recent successes in the US, uh, you know, you, you realize that if you get in really early, it's a low cost of entry um, and, and you can do really well. Um, you know, we don't exclude SMEs uh, from, from this, uh, the SMEs that have stable cash flows um, and that are looking to grow their businesses. Um, so for impact investing, you know, we always believe, you know, it's going to start with a purpose. So, so what are you going to achieve in the long run? and how are you gonna be able to deliver returns uh, to your investors and, and obviously do some good um, of whilst investing. So, um, you know, most of you would be familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
so we've got that very much at the back of our minds. Um, and, and the areas that we look at are FinTech, uh, where we're looking at uh, platforms that, that can offer uh, new products, uh, education, e-learning, healthcare, uh, technologies that uh, look at both pharmaceuticals, uh, as well as uh, telemedicine, uh, food, uh, you know, I think um, we, we stay, stay clear of food security uh, because we think that may be a political football, but, but really we're looking at how can you optimize food uh, for delivery uh, in, in urban areas, and then fourth, uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution. And I think a lot has been said about that, and AI is finally coming to, to, to the fore. Uh, as is Internet of Things. Uh, and I'll, I'll go in a bit, a bit more detail when I talk about pipeline uh, to tell you what we, we're looking at at the moment. So as this is you know, a showcase of the fund, uh, we, we thought, you know, let's talk about some of the deals that we've done and, and some of the opportunities uh, that we are looking at. Um, and, and I think, you know, a, we started this fund in 2019. So 2019 was really around getting some traction uh, in the marketplace, getting investors to understand the investment thesis because it's quite different. There are very uh, few technology-based uh, venture capital funds in the country. Um, and uh, 2020 was meant to be the year when we start to deploy capital. Uh, and we know what COVID, uh, you know, how COVID impacted all our lives. Uh, during the, uh, the past uh, 12 months. So, so the first one uh, is an investment in a company called BusyMed. It's a 30% stake, um, you know, and uh, for all of these businesses, uh, we focus on the founder and the founding team. Uh, we make sure that we, we understand, you know, where they're headed. And uh, Mbati, uh, uh, the founder of this company, uh, comes out of Port Elizabeth, uh, with a few of his uh, university friends uh, set up this company where, you know, the focus is how do we connect patients to pharmacies? How do we arrange, arrange delivery? And, and you must realize that when this was set up, we had no knowledge of COVID uh, coming on. So COVID's actually impacted the acceleration of deployment. Um, but still, you know, there's, there's, there's still a lot of selling to do to convince pharmacies to come on board. Um, delivery is done with a vast array of uh, service companies that, that provide it. The platform is there basically to showcase uh, whether it's an independent pharmacist or a group of pharmacies. Some of the key operating stats and, and why, you know, what's exciting us about this. Uh, so, so far uh, in 2020, uh, we've implemented this in, in 25 pharmacies, really looking at how we can, uh, you know, uh, ensure that this uh, model is working well. So we iron out all the increases. Um, we're working with a single operator, which has got a 55 uh, pharmacies in, in their chain. Uh, we're also deploying to independent pharmacies. Uh, the app has been downloaded at least 3,000 times that's where, when it's being in use. Um, and I think one of the things they, they, they look at as a leading indicator is the percentage of uninstalls. Uh, so it's at a low 5% at the moment. Uh, the app is now being rolled out in the App Store with iOS. Um, there's a whole bunch of new services uh, that are going to be launched. Uh, in February, which also would look at inventory management uh, for the pharmacy owner. And, uh, you know, as with most uh, startups and technology-based startups, we're moving the business model from a, a free plan uh, to a freemium model. So this is a basic option and there's a premium option which the pharmacy can subscribe to. Um, so, so what's getting us really excited um, is that there's been interest by a national supermarket chain uh, and, and they're really looking at how they can leverage this tech uh, to offer the solutions to their clients. 
uh, or their customers. Uh, so there's a potential, you know, white label uh, uh, through their supply chain or a potential acquisition. Um, also, there's a very large pharmacy group um, that I interested um, and, and we're working with them, uh, and Patti and his team are working with them uh, to develop a, a, a model around that. Uh, one of our retail banks has expressed an interest where they've got an ecosystem uh, to their clients and, and they've gone out into the market uh, in 2020. Uh, you know, and I think uh, with COVID, uh, home deliveries are becoming uh, high on, on, on the agenda. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Telenet Health, but you know, there's an opportunity for us to package BusyMed uh, the busy med offering with Telenet Health, and in that way, be able to offer a whole series of services um, to the individuals, whether they are are, are doctors, uh, hospitals, or patients. So that's that's busy med, and we we're very excited. You know, obviously, there's lots of work to be done. Uh, Dimitri and, and and Brett from time to time are supporting this team. Uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the next one is the Mara Found Retail Program. Um, many of you would recall uh, the state president's uh, first investment conference. Uh, one of the investors that committed was the Mara Group and uh, to build a factory in Durban in the Dubé trade port and to manufacture these phones. So more than 85% of the, 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 the manufacturing process takes place locally. Um, the phone, um, and, and, and what we've been able to tag onto was the retail element of this. Uh, the CEO of this is, is Dr. Mabuti Radebe. Uh, Mabuti is a PhD a nuclear physicist um, and uh, you know, he, he got tired of working in, in, in that space and, and wanted something uh, really, really new and different. And he approached us uh, with this uh, offering. Um, so, so, so the business model here is creating a master franchise distribution for the Mara phone in South Africa, um, contracted uh, cell phone operators uh, and having access to the government uh, transversal contract. Um, you see there, I've put at the bottom the Mara phone uh, website. And uh, as, as a plug to, to our company, if you go on there and you use the coupon Lion, uh, you can get uh, a, a special discount on the introductory offers. So I hope you, you guys uh, take, take advantage of that. So, so what have we done thus far? Um, the first store was opened in, uh, at Maponia Mall in Soweto. Uh, this store was uh, planned for Easter, the week before Easter, in fact. And, and obviously COVID, with COVID, with the shutdown, all of that had to be revisited. We really got going again towards the end of October and the store opening on the 5th of November. Uh, great response in Soweto, uh, and you can see there on the left, uh, this is the first franchisee. Uh, she is a newsreader on ENCA. Um, uh, um, and uh, this is basically the store layout. It's a typical layout of the store, um, 40 square meters, and, and it would be an experienced store. So, uh, you know, customers who come in there uh, we'll really get to play around with, with the devices, uh, you know, as more devices are rolled out. Uh, obviously, they can get, uh, buy, buy the product, get contracts. Uh, there are financing arrangements for this. And remember, we're targeting the, the bottom of the pyramid. So for us, uh, digital enablement is important. And we believe that, you know, these are the target market for us is people that are moving from feature phones to their first smartphone. So, so that's really the target market. And, and the, the employees at the stores uh, are what we would consider a device expert. So there's nothing about the device that they wouldn't be able to understand. And that will be the difference between going into one of these stores and going into 
a regular cell phone operator uh, store where you know they've got a myriad of different devices and you, you're quite lucky if you find somebody that's knowledgeable. Uh, we had a pop-up store in Clearwater Mall for Christmas, uh, which went down really well. And you can see here, that's the kind of layout for the pop-up stores. So for events, we will be targeting different malls. Uh, great, great interest from uh, for franchise uh, opportunities around the country. Um, our target is to uh, roll out about 50 stores nationally. Uh, and, and we're looking at four stores in Q1. Obviously, the online marketplace is there, but we believe that people that are migrating from a feature phone to a smartphone uh, probably will need assistance. We'll need to understand uh, what the technology is about. Um, you know, whilst most people on this call probably take that for granted, uh, I think that there will be a real need for that. Uh, we're also looking at negotiating some large uh, corporate accounts. And um, what we found is, you know, from, from the experience in Soweto uh, is that um, uh, company owners have come up and have placed large orders uh, for these phones. Uh, so, so corporate accounts are there. And then obviously, you know, the, the three key products we have is the Mara S, which is the intro uh, le uh, level phone, and the X1 and the Z1, and we've got a bit of the pricing there. And the new products we'll be looking at uh, are the Mara Tablet uh, and then the Mara Rugged. And the Mara Rugged is obviously, you know, uh, shockproof, waterproof, uh, ideal for the mining industry, construction and the like. So, so the third investment we've made is uh, Telenet Doctor, it's the JV and uh, Dr. Numan Mohammed, a, a clinician based in Cape Town, he leads this uh, uh, for us. Um, the, the technology has, has been, or the framework of the tech has been based uh, and built in the US uh, with the development teams in Israel, Romania, and Pakistan. And, uh, and what attracted us to this and why, why we felt this was different is that there's, there are a number of telemedicine platforms available in South Africa. And, and, and a lot of them focus on acute care. So if you're not feeling well, you know, you log on to it and you can have a teleconsult uh, with your doctor. There's very few in the market um, that look at chronic long-term medi uh, medical care. So, so you know, and, and some of the, the key things that we were looking for was how do we position this company to start uh, to take advantage of what may be coming down the line at us in South Africa. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But what are we doing right now, and Numan and his team are, are developing a pilot for South Africa. So we've taken a few use cases and, and uh, the two use cases that I can share with you is an aged care facility, looking at how we uh, do chronic care for, for older people. And then we've taken a very large uh, GP practice uh, on the outskirts of Gauteng, uh, who, have, who has a number of uh, clients that are in the various villages around. Uh, so we want to just see what the impact of that would be. Um, so, so what's getting us excited about this? Um, Generally, the focus on chronic healthcare, um, uh, the, the two critical things there are medication and case management. So if you just think about, uh, you know, somebody that's got diabetes or, or tuberculosis, uh, ensuring that they have their medication regularly taken all the time, uh, and effectively you offer the, the, the case management capability to the medical aid. Uh, we've also got built-in video consult, uh, and there's also an education uh, aspect to it, where people can log in and effectively troubleshoot, you know, what they're feeling, and if they want to know more, there may be a video available. Uh, there's also videos available on it um, that talk to uh, the, the latest breakthroughs in, in uh, medication, so that can be sponsored by 
uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and obviously, you know, from, from a um, consent and, and uh, security perspective, you know, uh, the system is compliant to GDPR and HIPAA. And, and I think the, 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 the elements of the pilot are really, you know, what does the South African Medical Society require? You know, what do we need to measure? So if, you, if you're thinking about uh, case management or we're managing uh, chronic health care, you know, what are the triggers? So if your blood pressure is constantly high, then a trigger would be sent off to the nurse or to the doctor that's attended to you. So as I mentioned, you know, the pilot that we have is, is large uh, GP practice on the outskirts of Johannesburg. Uh, we're working with TAFTA uh, in Durban, uh, which is an aged care. And they've got some 3,500 uh, uh, members in their community that they take care of. Uh, we're planning a similar pilot in Cape Town. Uh, one of the big un, un, unaddressed areas in South Africa is occupational health. So if you look at a major mining company that's got, you know, maybe 40,000 employees, uh, what you'd find generally is that 70% of them would be without medical uh, aid. And all their medical requirements are are generally taken up by the um, company. Um, and the company just accepts that as a cost of operating. Uh, what, what we would be able to offer companies there is, you know, in terms of people that are um, uh, chronic, uh, have chronic ailments, you know, HIV uh, is a critical one. Have we lost the presentation there, Mike? Okay. Yeah, all good, Devin. I'm just going to ask you if you could uh, move towards the close. I'm just um, yeah. always watching the time. Thank you. Okay. So, so, and and for us, the the, uh, the the final thing is is to be positioned for the national health insurance. So, so that that's got, got us pretty excited. So, we made those three investments. Uh, the pipeline, uh, you know, we've been impacted by the uncertainty of COVID. Um, and, and one of the things that we've tried to do in the pipeline is to identify female founders, women founders. So that's been a focus for us. So, so these are some of the projects that we're looking at. We've done, you know, a fair bit of work with these companies, uh, touchless payments, uh, township insurance, uh, keyboard payment system. Um, so, so we're quite excited because that will bring uh, a different element of um, technology in, in the fintech space. Uh, the education, uh, women learning platform and gig work for university students. Uh, as you can understand, with universities not really operating or, 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 or not operating enough, uh, that was put on, on the back burner. Healthcare, a fantastic pharma supply chain uh, opportunity that we have with a female founder. And, and the pregnancy journey with a group of female founders and on food, uh, a urban health farm. So how do we take a warehouse and, and translate that into a, a productive farm? All right. Uh, a, bit on, a bit on the investment opportunity. Um, I think, you know, we, we've seen that before, that those are the sort of limits. Uh, the shares that we valued are now at 1350. The original share was at 10 when we issued it and we're not charging an annual management fee. Uh, there's a once-off capital raise fee and, and we've got an incentive for the mango after paying back the full investment. Um, um, I think I'll leave it there, Mike. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, Devin. An interesting presentation and obviously there's lots more detail you can, you can share with us. I liked your, your one statement, impact investment is core and your reference to social upliftment and this definitely positions your fund very very well given the the growing global conversation that people are joining regarding esg and i'm sure that will stand you in, in great stead and thank you very much for your presentation staying on the impact theme we're going to move on to on to sorrel fisser who is going sorrel is the chief investment I beg your pardon, the Chief Executive Director and Founder of the Impact Fund. He believes that business is the only tool to solve the world's problems sustainably. So that's a very, very interesting belief statement, and Sorrel is no doubt going to talk a little bit more to that. 
The fund's mission is to increase the success rate of businesses and to share their philosophy that they call business as a tool. And they are always focusing on businesses that are, yes, making a profit, but at the same time, making an impact. Thank you, Sorrel. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks uh, for the listeners joining in today. Please uh, feel free to uh, submit any questions through the Q&A, or I will also provide an email address at the end of this presentation where you can gladly or um, freely answer or ask any questions, and we will come back to you directly. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I've prepared a short presentation. Just want to make sure that we can see it nice and clear. Mike, if you can maybe just confirm that it is displaying. All good, uh, Sarah. Very, very clear. Thank you. Okay. So as Mike said, we believe that business is the only sustainable solution to the world's problems and especially Africa's problems. And it's a simple philosophy because we believe that when a business figures out how to solve a problem at a profit, it actually creates a self-funded and more sustainable solution. So it's a simple philosophy, um, but it's not that easy to find businesses that does it that well, even though there are entrepreneurs in Africa that does it extremely well. But to, to find those gems, uh, that is our task. And um, I must say it is, we've selected some impact sectors, um, specifically focused at the agri sector and the conservation sector, because we see, especially with COVID, that the food value chain and um, agribusinesses are still growing in spite of the challenges we face. So, so I think we are quite well positioned from an agri uh, perspective. So let me just run through our vision. Um, the first thing is we are looking for investors that share our philosophy. We are looking for investors that believe that profit is like food, water, and oxygen, quite critical for life, but not the reason for life. So there must be more to a business than just trying to make money. Because what we've seen now in these difficult times where the markets have shifted significantly, businesses, and especially SMEs, um, that were focused heavily on just profits. The when the market shifted, Luckily for some of them, they were agile enough, but for the other ones that didn't really had a reason why they were making that profit, it was very difficult for them to discover why the market has shifted. And therefore, like uh, Pablo has pointed out, there was significantly uh, thinning out happening in certain industries, especially amongst the SMEs. For us, it's very important to be able to measure um, the impact and also to, to see some positive social um, impact while still delivering a good return to our investors. For us, it's all about the entrepreneur. And I think again, both Pablo and uh, Devin has referred to it. It's, it's important to invest in the people running the businesses in SMEs um, because you, ultimately those businesses are so small and the management teams are thin. So if the mindset is incorrect, it will not be a good investment. So we are looking for entrepreneurs and businesses that already have uh, the mindset that are already making the impact. And our money is just the fuel on the fire. It's not, we are not helping them to make the fire. Then it was also quite pleasing for me to see in Devin's presentation that they are also very well aligned with uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And for us, it's all about that measurability. We want to make sure that impact can be measured because I think there's a lot of confusion currently in the market amongst the impact investment space where the majority of investors believe that impact investment is just another way of donating your money. Where impact investment, in our view, should be finding that balance between impact and financial return, making sure that the impact ensures sustainability and financial returns make sure that it's worth both your while as an investor to stay in, but also for the entrepreneur to stay interested. Let me just quickly take you through our fund structure. So we have five share classes, and I'm just gonna give you a, a quick overview of each of them. 
They are ring fence share classes and each of the share classes are managed and um, advised through an advisory committee that advises the board on how we deploy the capital raised. So you will see we are heavily invested in the agri space and those of you who know me well know that I'm also an um, active farmer and I own a, a few farms and uh, have grown up in the agri industry so we understand that industry quite well. <clears throat> and most of the investments that we are making is actually investments that we as a family, my family has been making for many years already and we understand how it works in the, in the background, what the real returns are, what the real risks are. So we're not coming from a investment banking side, we're actually coming from an entrepreneurial and agri um, side. So the first one is agri-tech. Um, so we invest in agri-technology. Um, that is a very difficult one. And for those of you who are not that familiar with agri-tech and haven't seen what is happening there, it, uh, there is a boom currently um, in the number of new agri-tech um, being developed. Our focus is mostly around software, hardware, and connectivity. Um, so drones and management software, and then obviously rural connectivity to, in, to enable those technologies. Then the second share class is our agri-herd, um, where we actually invest into companies that offers alternative financing models to farmers through which they can extend their herd or increase their herd. So our primary focus there is um, sheep and dairy cattle. And believe it or not, um, for the past decade, our family has been in that space and um, you won't believe, but your returns are in excess of 20% per annum quite easily. And if you understand the risk, it's a really, really good return because um, it keeps on going. It's, it's asset backed, but I, I will dive into more detail in agri herd soon. Then agri equip is very similar just with equipment. So it's rentals and um, yeah, we're quite excited. We currently in talks with about three different uh, other funds uh, that wants to co-invest into our qualifying um, companies. And we welcome this because we want to ultimately increase the amount of alternative funding available to the farmers. Then our My Rhinos um, share class is very similar to the agri herd side, but just with a very specific um, focus on rhinos and rhino breeding stock. So we invest into rhino breeding stock, we breed more rhinos and we um, rent them, the rhinos out to um, breeding operations um, yeah, it's, a, it's actually very simple, but, but um, quite impactful. If you think about the crisis that we have with our rhinos and the cost of just acquiring a rhino. Then our Amandla share class is for black investors only. So we only accept the investment from black investors. And then that share class invests into the already qualifying underlying investments of the other share classes. And in that way, we assist our QCs, our qualifying companies with increasing their BE um, status and scorecard. Then we have <clears throat> quite a strong advisory board that advises the board on various matters. And you can see there's some heavyweights on there like Johan Giel, who's the COO of Afgri, we have Gugu Nixweni, um, and then we have Peter Dijkman, who is a large commercial farmer, Joe van der Walt, who is the managing director of Code, which is a very well-known um, software development company in Johannesburg, and then Rory from Jaltec advises us on the compliance side. So quite a strong um, advisory team. And then we have a small but potent management team it's myself, Joe Kutzer, who is the a director at Mondi's, and then Ben Fulyun, who is the general manager of our fund manager. And unfortunately, Ben is um, still on leave today and his connectivity is not allowing him to present. So I will um, continue to, to present, but um, I hope at the next opportunity that you will get to meet been in person and uh, hear what he has to say and how he, see how excited he is about all of the things we are doing in this fund. So I thought it 
well, to maybe just dive into a little bit more detail about AgriHerd and AgriQuip. Um, so AgriHerd is investing into livestock rental companies. And I, and I know the majority of you are now probably sitting there and say, how does that work? How do you invest into livestock rentals or how do you rent livestock? So as I said, I, I'm a farmer myself. I rent about 850 ewes from um, one of the company of my family's company. Um, and just to, to show you the, the calculation. So currently you produce, um, if you do intensive sheep farming, you produce 2.2 lambs per year per you. A lamb's average price is 1,600 rand um, at the market rate right now. And the average rent per year or per annum per you is varies between 300 and 360 rand per you. So you can see for the farmer, it is a really, really good deal. And if you look at your return on capital, 360 rand per year on a capital outlay of anything between one and a half thousand to 2000 rand, you can go and do the calculation. It's quite a good return um, from an investor point of view. But we do understand the risk. As I said, our family has been doing this for many years and we understand the risk. So what we've done to help manage that risk is we've actually incorporated a self-funded uh, insurance pool, which is underwritten by Santam Structured Insurance to reduce the risk associated with uh, being invested into livestock. And we cover up to 24% uh, uh, of the total asset base can be lost without a single loss being fed through to our investors. We are quite conservative when we um, forecast our target returns. So we promise our investors a target return of between seven and 10% on initial capital. And I just wanna point out, so we don't see ourselves as a section 12J fund that is selling the tax benefit. The tax benefit is a sweetener on top of what we do. So we measure ourselves against normal private equity funds, and therefore we promise a return on initial capital. If you would have brought in the tax benefit there, you will that return would obviously significantly increase, close to double um, if you do the calculation. Um, and, and maybe just if you, if you, we're currently working on a company that have thirty five thousand use under management, and we in. Uh, talks to finalize uh, a deal in the next few months. Then the next one is our agri herd um, share class, where we invest into companies that do agri related equipment rentals. And again, we believe that those rentals should be in non income generating movable assets. Obviously, it helps with the risk management because that prop that asset is never the farmer's property. So I don't have to go to the court to go and find or, or, or to, to go and take away that asset if they stop paying the rent. Um, so it's much easier to manage than if you actually have physical um, ownership transferred. I think the, the other very important thing for us is when we select partners um, to do or to invest in, we actually look at how strong the transactional side of the business is so that if a renter or rentee will um, default, then you can easily and quickly reduce your risk by simply selling that product or that asset through the transactional um, stream. Again, we forecast a um, target return of seven to 10% on initial capital, not on risk capital. On risk capital, it's significantly higher. So I'm gonna maybe point out some of the key risk management factors that we built into these asset-backed um, investments. Obviously the asset-backed, so there's physical assets, but it's movable assets, so it's easy to recover those assets. And um, the other thing is we look at the partners and as I said, they have to have a strong transactional business so that you can address your risk through the transactional side should a default occurs. We also use the rental partners to do those um, credit betting um, on all new clients. And we we'll normally see that 
the partner actually have a good long standing relationship with that farmer anyway. So if you think about Afgri, Ubaru, any of those um, big agri names, they have an account or the farmer have an account with them for many, many years, probably in excess of 20, 30 years with a credit rating already in there. So instead of us trying to figure out how credible this farmer is, we actually use our partner's data to make sure that we don't rent um, to a farmer that can't pay. Then we also have a first loss cover with the partners. So obviously uh, the, the partner takes the first loss that incentivizes them to ensure that we don't make any losses or that we don't rent out um, livestock or equipment to potential defaulting rentees. And then lastly, we also drive a strong monthly rental. So you at most a, a prepaid monthly rental model so that your exposure is seven days. Within seven days after the rent is due, you know if that um, if you're at risk or not, and you still have enough time to actually do something about it. And then obviously, again, it's movable assets, so you can then go and um, take ownership or um, just remove the assets from the farm or wherever it is. That is a quick overview of our fund. Um, so if you have any questions, please post them now or simply send it to invest at impactfund.com. You can also go to our website and download or request a complete copy of our private placement memorandum that have all of the questions and answers and a lot of detail um, in it. Um, and then I want to leave you with this quote from Sir Richard Branson. He says, every risk is worth taking as long as it's for a good cause and contributes to a good life. So with that, Mike, um, back to you. Thank you for that, Sorrel, and what a good close. I really love that quote by Richard Branson. Uh, you've definitely got an interesting investment thesis uh, that's offering attractive returns. I was just curious as to what, it, what the one thing is that differentiates you from your competitors in this segment of the 12J industry? So Mike, as I said, I think what really differentiates us is that we are not coming from the investment side. We are coming from the agri and the entrepreneurial side. We understand those businesses. For the past 20 years in my own business, uh, Grovation, that, that's the consulting side of it and the fund management side of it. We've been helping these SMEs and agri businesses grow. That's what we do. Um, from a longer history, my family has been in agri. I mean, our family farm is over 200 years in the family. We understand agri. We understand the risks. We, we, we've been doing these type of investments in our, uh, with our own money long before Section 12J was even registered as a potential. And therefore, our philosophy is also to not sell ourselves as a Section 12J only, but as a private equity investment where your investment money is not going to be in that structure on its own. It is there with ours, and um, we are taking it serious to make sure that we don't take losses, and therefore our investors don't take any losses. All right, thanks. That sounds compelling, Sorrel, and good to meet you, albeit digitally, and thank you for presenting. Our thanks, next Mike. is Gaurav Nair. Gaurav will be presenting on the Infinity Anchor Fund, and Gaurav is the He's the MD of this fund. He's a qualified actuary with <clears throat> extensive experience regarding capital raising, investment management, and capital structuring. Gaurav, thank you for joining us. Looking forward to the next 20 minutes with you. Thank you, Mike. Let me know if you can see that. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming, and um, I'm very excited to present what we have here today. Um, as Mike said, I'm uh, the MD of the uh, Infinity Anchor Fund and also one of the co founders of Jaltech. And today I'm here to talk about uh, two investment options that we're bringing to the market this year. Um, these two options, the first is infinity performance. 
and Infinity Performance is the product that we have been managing for the last few years. Um, it's been the top performing fund in 2019 and 2020 uh, in its class. It's been tracking a return of about 15% plus per annum. Um, and that return is measured on, on net capital, um, con the concept that, that Jonty went through earlier. Typically, we, we do like to talk about gross capital. Um, but however, if we include the net capital measures you'll see in this presentation. Um, and that's mainly for comparison purposes because the industry talks about that. Um, we, uh, we had 100% of our capital invested uh, prior to the 20th of February, 2020. We've maintained a six monthly dividend payment track record with the last dividend being an annualized dividend of 5.2% per annum. And we have a low performance fee. We charge our performance fee on gross capital, uh, unlike a lot of the funds out there that charge performance fees on net capital, which results in quite a high performance fee being charged to investors. The new investment option we have this year, and I'll talk about it later on in the presentation, is a fund called Infinity Stable. And Infinity Stable was our answer to objections raised by people who were hesitant to either invest in Section 12J at all, or, or hesitant to invest in the South African economy. And so we designed an investment option that, that tries to mitigate some of those hesitations. Um, and the way it works is that the income from the underlying investments in Infinity Stable is underpinned by a guarantee from credible and strong counterparties. Um, the, the, those investments also have a, a guaranteed exit price resulting in the return of capital being predictable to investors. Overall, this leads to predictable returns. Um, on the Infinity Stable uh, side, we charge no performance fees given the predictable nature of, of the investment. And we have a low minimum investment uh, for investors to come in. So starting off with Infinity Performance. Infinity Anchor Fund invests in equity into asset rental businesses. These businesses, by their very nature, they have an asset rich balance sheet and contractual regular cash flows. Uh, this lends itself to clear and planned exits, um, resulting in, uh, in, in more certainty around being able to return funds back to our investors. We target investing 100% of our funds. Um, and this is unlike numerous competitors of ours that target investing 80% of the funds. Now, 80% is the compliance limit. So we find that to be too risky a strategy to only target investing 80% of funds, and we go for investing 100% of funds. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the performance fees charged by the fund manager are only charged on gross capital. So that's after all capital has been returned to investors. Now I wanna take you through a couple of noteworthy North, North investments that we made um, to give you a sense of the type of investments we like. The first is an investment that we made almost two years ago now, and it's into a business called Secutech. And Secutech, they do the rentals of security technology. Their typical counterparties are corporates or estates. And these counterparties, uh, they rent smart alarm systems, cameras, electric fencing, etc. cetera. Uh, Secutech has had a 0% bad debt rate. That is before COVID and during COVID and the lockdowns. And it makes sense when you consider that security is considered a top priority for, for most people. Um, and so people would, would very, it would be very unlikely for people to default uh, and then have their cameras and their security systems come and taken away. Um, we've been receiving, achieving a, a, a return of 9.73% per annum and that's excluding any tax benefits that the investor gets. The second investment I'd like to highlight is, is our investment into Rise Telecoms. We made this investment in, in June of last year, um, and this was in the midst of the lockdown. And um, the Rise's business is the ownership and running of high-speed 
fiber internet networks. And as you can imagine, during the lockdown and after, but during the lockdown especially, with the rise of people working at home and connectivity becoming increasingly important, high-speed connectivity rise saw demand go through the roof. Um, what we've seen is that even after the lockdown, uh, the performance and rise has continued to be good. And that's because when people start getting the use of high-speed internet, it becomes very difficult to, to go back and not use high-speed internet anymore. Um, so we invested about just over 21 million Rand with RISE. And the investment has performed very well at 9.45% per annum. And we expect the investment to continue to perform well uh, in, in the coming years. Now I wanna talk a bit about um, our pipeline. With the onset of COVID last year in February, March, um, what we did was we actually went back and we had a, a pipeline of 250 to 300 million Rand of investments that we had pre-diligence and were ready to invest into. However, we went back and re-looked at this pipeline with an additional criteria, which is COVID resilience. And what we were looking for is we wanted to see that the investments that were in our pipeline had performed well before COVID and performed well during COVID and lockdowns. With the uncertainty of how many lockdowns there would be, uh, when, if and when a vaccine would come out at that time, um, and so not, not knowing if, how, if the environment, if it will be a, more similar to a pre-lockdown environment or a post-lockdown environment, we wanted to see good performance that was consistent, not just pre-lockdown and not just post-lockdown either, but consistent. And we went back and re-diligenced the entire pipeline and actually built up a new pipeline from scratch. We ended up throwing everything out of the pipeline except for eyes, which we ended up investing into and building up a brand new pipeline. Uh, this is a summary of the current pipeline. And in fact, two of these uh, investments were approved in December by our investment committee, and we are busy now going through the deployment process. Um, as you can see from this pipeline, it's across a variety of industries. Uh, it's between 150, 200 million Rand in size. The estimated returns are between 10 to 25%, excluding the tax benefit. So this is just the return to infinity. And 80% of this pipeline is exclusive. To infinity. Now to just take you through how the infinity performance has performed. The 2019 class had a average dividend yield, this is on gross capital of 4.94%. For comparison purposes, on net capital, this is 8.99%. Our return on gross capital has been 5.78% per annum. The projected returns on net capital is 15.96% uh, per annum. And we have 100% of this class invested. Now, in the industry, very few Section 12J funds publish their performance. So what we have done is we've drawn up a comparison between our fund and our largest competitor. And this is so that investors can make an informed decision. Uh, often investors find it quite difficult to find these performance stats uh, in the public domain. So as we can see, Infinity's gross dividend yield is significantly higher than that of our largest competitor, 494 to 1.5%. We're tracking an IRR on net capital of 15.96% compared to 10.8%. Um, Infinity's uh, net asset value, that's the value of the investment, excluding all dividends that have been paid out, has, has grown whereas our largest competitor has seen their net asset value shrink. And what this means is that the investment today is worth less than at the time the investors made the investment. We charge a gross performance fee, uh, unlike our largest competitor. We have 100% of capital invested while our largest competitor is sitting quite cash heavy. Um, our dividends are paid on profits only and not capital invested. So this harkens back to the shrinking net asset value for our, comp for our largest competitor. Another way to interpret this is that some of the dividends they have pay, been paid out has been partially out of capital, resulting in a shrinking net asset value. Um, we have a low minimum investment size of 200,000 Rand, and we're proud to publicly report our performance. This picture here is just a graphical representation of the same numbers, and I think it illustrates quite clearly the discrepancy in returns. Now, this graph here, um, the, 
it's got two sections. On the left of the line going down the middle is the actual performance of us versus our largest competitor. And to the right is the projected performance. The projected performance that we project for our own fund and the projected performance of our competitor according to them. So this is their projection. And what's interesting is you can see in the actual portion that uh, our largest competitor's performance started to suffer. And they project the suffering performance going forward. And what this results in over five years is it results in a difference as high as 15% uh, of gross capital uh, in performance. Now onto the, the new investment option we're bringing to the market, Infinity Stable. As I mentioned earlier, Infinity Stable was our answer to some of the hesitations that people in the market had, both to 12J and exposure to the South African economy. These major hesitations were the performance of Section 12J funds, which a lot of the funds have had poor performance or don't report on it, uh, the uncertainty around exit, investors being afraid that they would be in from longer than the five-year term, significantly longer because some of these funds don't have clear exit strategies and what that means for investors and their liquidity and exposure to the South African economy. So we designed a product that caters to these specific objections. Specifically, um, we invest into asset rental businesses again, but these asset rental businesses are with a counterparty and those counterparties have long track records and expertise and operational capacity in, in the asset rental space, as well as strong balance sheets. And they provide these asset rental businesses with an income guarantee, a minimum income guarantee. And secondly, they provide an exit guarantee that after five years, these businesses can sell the asset rental books back to, the, to, that, to these counterparties, and that will create the liquidity to exit investors predictably. All of this leads to predictable return for investors. So let me tell you about some of the, uh, the performance stats that this is expected to earn. It'll be earning a net dividend yield of about 3.69% per annum, uh, an IRR a net capital of 10.95% per annum. Now this IRR, all of the underlying contracts are floating. So this IRR will, will increase or decrease with prime. And since we're sitting in a low interest rate environment and expect the interest rate to go up, the expectation is that the IRR will, will, will go up with, with the movements in prime. Um, it has, of course, the guaranteed earnings in the underlying investments, the guaranteed exits in the underlying investments, and the ability to deploy our capital by March 2021. Now, on this slide here, we compare Infinity Stable to the performance of our largest competitor. And uh, you'll see what on the next slide. So firstly, Infinity Stable, of course, has the limited risk due to the mitigations of the guaranteed income and the ability to exit at a fixed price in five years, which of course, our largest competitor doesn't have. We charge no performance fee in Infinity Stable, where our largest competitor charges a net performance fee, that's that high performance fee. We have a predictable deployment of capital um, and we have the, the low minimum investment size. And why this becomes important is if you compare what Infinity Stable is projected to do to the performance of our largest competitor, you can see that the two are virtually indistinguishable. However, uh, our largest competitor doesn't have any of the risk mitigants that Infinity Stable does. And this final graph really speaks to the difference between Infinity Stable and a cash investment, a five-year cash investment. And um, as you can see, the, the return is quite similar. However, the, uh, the cash investment has to be made from post-tax income because there's no, there's no tax deduction. Whereas because Infinity Stable is a 12J investment, you get larger exposure. And so you earn this similar return, but on a larger pool of capital, um, resulting in better returns overall. Um, so that's the that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you need any, if there's any interest, you'd like to set up an appointment, any questions, please feel free to, to email info at jaltech.co.za. Thank you.
Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you for a very, very interesting presentation and well within time. And no doubt the quality of the underlying investee companies is key in, in 12J. And your statement rings, uh, rings loud and clear when you said SecuTech has a 0% bad debt. And that is sure to translate into exceptional returns for investors in this fund. Just a quick question to you before handing over to our last speaker, John T. Sachs. Uh, Gaurav, please highlight for me two features that differentiate you from a very, very competitive space in the 12J industry. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'd say that the two features, one is uh, our focus on, on deployment and on finding interesting uh, um, um, rental models that either can command uh, better returns or have uh, very good risk mitigation like Secutech, like Secutech that you mentioned uh, does have. So that's feature number one. Um, and I think feature number two, which separates us from from uh, the rest of the, from a large portion of the industry really is our, our, our gross performance fee. Um, and of course, then our willingness to report publicly on our performance to be, to be interrogated by, by investors. And then one more, one more question, Gaurav from Linda. You ask, so Gaurav, how does Infinity make their money on the stable fund if they don't charge performance fees? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So, um, so because of the, of the known nature and the predictable nature of the Infinity stable, um, we felt that there's, there's limited scope for Infinity as a fund manager to try and create art performance. And that's really what a performance fee is there for, is for to incentivize the manager to, to, to get involved with the underlying business and try and work hard to, to seek better returns. Um, since the product is, 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 is one that has quite predictable cash flows, um, Infinity fund manager only earns an annual performance um, in an annual, an annual management fee, as opposed to both an annual management fee and a performance fee. So with respect to Infinity Stable, uh, Infinity Fund Managers only makes an annual fee and there's no performance fee charged. Thank you, Gaurav, and thank you for an exceptional presentation and all the best in this year's fundraise. Our last speaker is John T. Sachs. And uh, for those of you who weren't here up front when I introduced John T. Sachs, very brief introduction. John T. is a partner at Geltech and head of marketing and new business. John T. is going to share with us insights regarding the Zimbali Capital Fund and also highlight some innovative guarantees that underpin the performance of this fund. Over to you, John T. Mark, thank you very much. Um, hi, once again, everyone. So Zimbali Capital is a property-backed Section 12J fund. As I mentioned earlier, when I gave an intro to Section 12J, property is prohibited as an investment except in the case of um, hotels, student accommodation, lodges, and BNBs. So we can invest into the sector. And in fact, historically, this sector has raised a, a, a more than 50% of all capital invested. However, um, other sectors are gaining quite quickly. So Zimbali Capital invests into, um, into uh, hospitality assets. Um, it is Sharia compliant, but the fund has a very unique um, offering. And that is the investments in which we invest come with a guaranteed exit of half of our investors' capital. This uh, guarantee is in the underlying investments. And how it works is if we invest, for example, 100 Rand into a hotel, after the five-year period, we'll then try and sell off the asset. If we fail to do so, the Zimbali Group have signed a guarantee that they'll buy 50% of all our investments at a price which will guarantee. If you ignore the tax benefit, approximately 7% as a return per year in the hands of the investor, with a tax benefit around 14%. Uh, we have historically invested into uh, student accommodation. Lares is an, is an asset which we've invested just under 13 million rand. Um, the asset's done exceptionally well. It's, it's returning, uh, if you ignore the tax benefit, in the underlying investment just under 10%, uh, 9.5%. And this assumes a property growth of 6%. Uh, the, the asset has uh, experienced 100% occupancy for many years. It's in close proximity to the university. It's very desirable. Um, and we are actually looking to make another investment in it this year, but I'll touch on that in a moment. 
Another investment which we've made is into a new hotel development. This hotel development is uh, or forms part of the greater part of uh, Zimbabwe estate in KZN, but it fills a unique void in the area in that it focuses at business travelers. So these are smaller units, around 40 to 50 square meters. The entry point or um, the cost per night is approximately 1.2 to 1.4 thousand rand a night. So it's really affordable in comparison to other hotels in the area, which are way more expensive. Um, construction is underway uh, and notwithstanding COVID, obviously we don't have any operational risks or operational costs at the moment because the hotel is still being developed. And we think once COVID subsides later in the year, that um, the hotel will be up and running and then uh, we shouldn't have too much of a concern around occupancy. Uh, the Zalza Lodge is a, a re very recent investment we've made. You may ask yourself the question, why would you invest in leisure or hotels given COVID or the state of the economy? Well, this investment came with a guarantee um, in the underlying investment and the guarantee has two components. One is the Greater Zimbabwe Group signed a guarantee of a guaranteed income in the underlying investment of 5% in year one, scaling up to 10% in the final year. So for our current investors, they'll experience a nice dividend income from this guarantee. And in addition, a guaranteed exit after the five-year term. How this guaranteed exit works is if we invest, for example, 100 Rand, the Zimbabwe group will buy back the investment after the five-year term at 117 Rand. And this gives us a 17% capital growth um, over the five-year term. From an investment case, I've used our 2019 investors as an example. Um, their funds are 100% invested. And so to our current investors, um, or in fact, 95% of our most recent investors' capital has been invested. Um, the fund has done relatively well in the market. Um, our average dividend yield is 4.1%. Our net dividend yield, so if you include the tax benefit, is around 7.5%. But our return on our gross capital, in other words, if uh, you ignore Section 12J as a tax benefit. As, a, as an investment, this is yielding 8% per year. And if you include the tax benefit to compare us to other funds, it's approximately 14.6%. If you compare us, similar to how Gaurav did earlier, if you compare us to our largest competitor in the student accommodation sector, you'll see Zimbabwe Capital is the line on the top, where our, the blue line is our competitor. Um, and the line in the middle uh, separates actual returns uh, versus projected returns. So using our competitors' figures, you'll see how the line drops off uh, to the bottom, whereas in Bali, um, particularly boosted by the guaranteed, the guarantee in the underlying investment, um, we think will continue to perform really nicely. If you do a comparison to our largest competitor in the hospitality sector, something I must disclaim is that the timelines here are not the same. The blue line at the bottom, this is a fund that's already reached maturity, whereas in Bali um, is still... Uh, in its five-year uh, investment term. But you can see from a returns perspective that our hospitality, uh, uh, the hospitality nature of our fund is done really well and we think it'll continue to do nicely going forward. If you do a like-for-like -like comparison, you can see our gross dividend yield uh, is around 4.1%, uh, which is significantly higher to our competitors in student accommodation and in hospitality. Uh, we're tracking around 14.6% with a tax benefit. Um, they're tracking just under 10%. Significant difference. We've had great growth in our NAV. We charge a gross performance fee. Where our competitor charges a performance fee, which includes the tax benefit, but there is a hurdle. Um, we offer a guaranteed exit and returns on half of our investors' capital. This guarantee is in the underlying investment. Um, all of our investors' capital is invested except for our, our latest investors, only 95%. So there's a very small percentage uninvested at this point in time. We only pay dividends out of profits and we've paid dividends uh, in the past. We had a recent uh, dividend which we distributed to our investors. Our minimum investment is 200,000 Rand and we publicly report on our returns. So if you went to joltech.co.za, you'd be able to see Infinity's and Zimbali's um, historic returns. For this year, we are limiting our investment to 35 million Rand. Uh, we're doing this because Zimbabwe wanted to uh, not over promise in terms of, uh, or not over um, burden their balance sheet and the balance sheet is really impressive. So they wanted to limit the, the guarantee this year to only the first 35 million Rand worth of investments. We'll be, we'll be investing 24 million Rand into Dizelza Lodge. And Dizelza Lodge comes with a guaranteed exit of 50% of investors capital, but also with a guaranteed yield of 3.6% in year one, scaling up to 6.5% in year five, 
And we're also looking to invest 11 million Rand into Dizelle Zalaj, which is, a, which is the student accommodation investment. We've um, got a historic track record of this investment, it's done really well, and it'll also include a 50% guarantee in the underlying investment. That's really it for me. Uh, from me, um, we are obviously in our fundraising period and we are accepting investments. So if you are looking to, to make an investment, um, please do reach out to us at info at, jolt, uh, at um, Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John T. You, you definitely showed us some, some exceptional performance versus competitors. And um, I just wanted to ask a question, how much of this difference in performance and that crocodile graph that you showed can be attributed to selecting quality bricks and mortar and how much can be attributed to the, the impact that high performance fees are, are having on some hospitality funds? Um, Mike, I think, you know, um, if you compare uh, Zavali Capital to student accommodation, um, that investment, I think the one issue that our competitors are having is cash drag. So, you know, if you're investing into uh, new developments or, or, or projects that are still under construction, there's obviously a delay and you're sitting on cash. And when you sit on cash, obviously, in this current times with the, with the interest rate being so low, the investors are going to be um, experiencing lower or poor performance returns. Where on our hand, we've really got a, our pipeline, it's secure, we invest very rapidly. Um, in a couple of months, we can invest our investors capital into assets that we really understand and have a track record with. So we experience operational profits, we, we experience performance very rapidly where our competitors are delayed. But even so, you know, if we invested in the same investment as our competitors, um, their performance would always, in my view, um, be lower than ours because of their performance fee. Um, ultimately, they're taking a, a huge chunk of the performance fee. They're taking the tax benefit into account, which I, I don't think uh, should be the case. You should be um, rewarded as a fund manager based on your investment performance, not on, on a tax incentive introduced by SARS. All right, great, great answer. We've got two more questions before we wrap up uh, from anonymous attendee playing devil's advocate with an apology that says, sorry, with the guarantee coming from the Zimbali group rather than a totally independent third party, is this guarantee worth anything really? Even the big boys can come short sometimes. Looking forward to your response to this, John D. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as a fund manager, we are incentivized around a performance fee and we only experience or enjoy that performance fee once the asset has been sold. So. Uh, we highly incentivize to ensure one that the balance sheet is robust and we've done that and we do that periodically and I can tell you from my own experience having reviewed the balance sheet it's really impressive uh, the Zamali group recently sold I think in the region of 200 million rands worth of properties to MDEC so they are really in a healthy position and um, so it's really on us the fund manager to ensure that we can call upon that guarantee our current view is that um, we can but let's assume for a moment that we got it completely wrong and we can't um, we, the our investors will then be in the same position as any other investor in a Section 12J property uh, fund, um, and we'll have to sell the assets into the market. We're fortunate to be in a position where we know how these assets are doing, and, they, and they've got a track record for years. So from a valuation perspective, we think that we can justify a valuation that we put into the market. But our competitors, if they're investing into a new development, you know, you then have to make you have to put projections into the market uh, in order to determine a valuation. And that can obviously be debated or negotiated down. So we think our investors are in a really firm position if, you know, for, you know, worst case scenario that we can't call on the guarantee, but, you know, I can give you my reassurance that I've reviewed the balance sheet and it's really impressive. All right. And then the final question in today's conference comes from Jeremy Squire. And John T, you can answer this question regarding Auric Infinity and Symbolic Capital. Jeremy asks, what are the minimums this year in total and per underlying investment? Hmm. So our, our minimums as a, as a business is 200,000 Rand. We're happy to accept investments of 100,000 in one fund and 100,000 into another fund, but ideally we'd like our investors to invest approximately 200,000 Rand. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna wrap and we are, we are giving you back some time, getting well in before 12 o'clock. Thank you to all the speakers today. And uh, I noted many, many takeaways and sound bites, and just two that resonated with me. Right up front, John T. Sachs had a belief statement. He said, I believe that the 12J industry will continue post June, perhaps with a couple of changes. 
And the statement was made by and alluded to by our two impact speakers who said investing in a 12J fund benefits the economy. And that has to be good news for all of us South Africans. Next step from here, you'll be contacted by the speakers today and members of their, their team. Slides will be shared and please reach out to us if you've got any more questions that you would like answered offline. Remember to all of you, no more coffee today if you finish that pot that you uh, brewed early on and all the best for the year. Thank you for attending.